Congressman Paul, uh, there is no denying you have an enthusiastic base support, base of support. We could hear them outside tonight. <laughs> Yet there was that recent interview you were asked if, uh, while campaigning, you envision yourself in the Oval Office, and you said, not really, but I think it's a possibility. So that begs the question about your path and when you will give an honest answer about perhaps your third party plans going forward. Are you in this regardless of the outcome to your right here on this stage? Well, unlike others, maybe they sit around and daydream about being in the White House. I just don't sit around daydreaming about it. But I'm in a race. I'm a good Good race. You, and you talk about electability. Um, why don't we take on the first three states and take everybody 30 years and under? I'm doing pretty darn well. I'm winning that vote. But what about if you compare my name to Obama? Uh, I do quite well, if not better, th than the rest. So uh, to say that there has only been three three races and talk about n not being electable, I think is is a bit of a stretch. Matter of fact, the delegate the delegates haven't even been appointed in Iowa yet. And quite frankly, we have a pretty good chance of getting a good sum of of, of those because of the organization. We only had a straw vote. I mean, this argument on who won it, it was a straw vote. I mean, the delegates is what 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 counts. So, but I do want to address the earlier uh, uh, discussion that you had about 1997. I had been out of the Congress for 12 years and I went back in 96 and, and, and arrived there in 97. It was chaotic, let me tell you. It was a mess and it was a mess for 12 years. And Newt had a big job on his hand, but he really had to attack the conservatives. And he did it boldly. And uh, quite frankly, I think the reason he, he didn't not run for speaker, you know, you know uh, two years later, he didn't have the votes. That was what the problem was. So this idea that he voluntarily reneged and he was going to punish himself because we didn't do well in the election, that's just not the way it was. Let me come at it this way. If Newt Gingrich emerges, emerges from the GOP primary process as the uh, nominee of the party, do you go your own way? Well, I've done a lot of that in my lifetime. <laughs> uh, I, should, I should be more specific. Will you run as a third party candidate? Uh, I have no plans to do that, no intention, and uh, when I've been pressed on it, they ask me why, and I said I don't want to. But uh, I haven't been an absolutist. Uh, when I left Congress, I didn't have many plans on going back, but uh, I did after 12 years. I went back to medicine. So, no, uh, I don't have any, any plans to do that, no. Would you support a new Gingrich as nominee of the GOP? Well, you, you know, he keeps hinting about uh, attacking the Fed, and he talks about gold. Now, if I could just change him on foreign policy, we might be able to talk business. <laughs> Speaker Gingrich, you willing to adjust to pick up an, a, uh, an endorsement from Texas? Well, I got one on Friday from Governor Perry, which I liked a lot uh, as a starting point. So I like endorsements from Texas. Uh, and and uh, Congressman Paul's right. There, there's an area, I think, what he has said about the Federal Reserve and what he has said about the importance of monetary policy, the proposal I've issued for a gold commission, which harkens back to something that he and Jesse Helms helped develop and which he served on in 1981, uh, and the fact that we have people of the caliber of, of Lou Lehrman and Jim Grant who have agreed they would chair such a commission, I think there are areas we can work on. There are places we disagree very deeply. Iran is a good example. But there are places, you know, you build a coalition by trying to find ways you can work together. And frankly, we could work together a lot more than either one of us could work with Barack Obama. Create an opportunity for folks who have houses to realize their losses and at least help them out. That's why I proposed in my tax plan. When I, I talk about five areas where I allow deductions, well, one of them would be to be able to deduct losses from the sale of your home. Right now, you can't do that. You have to pay gains depending on the amount. But you can't deduct the losses. This is something I think is important temporarily to put in place to allow people the freedom to be able to go out and get, get out from underneath these houses that they're holding on to and at least get some relief from the federal government for doing so. Uh, Congressman Paul, should that be any role for the government? Are those folks owed anything for being uh, under? Well, the government owes them a free market and a sound monetary system, but they didn't give it to them. They gave them a mess. They gave them a financial system that literally created this problem. And it, it, it was compounded. First, the line of credit to the, to the Federal Reserve. It was excessive. Everybody now admits in Washington interest rates were kept too low too long. But not only that, in addition to that, it was an insult to injury because uh, they kept interest rates especially low with Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, and there was a line of credit there, and it was a guarantee. Matter of fact, I had interest 
introduced legislation 10 years before the bubble burst to eliminate that line of credit. But then the uh, Community Reinvestment Act added more fuel to it, you know, forcing banks to make loads that are risky loans. So the whole bubble was easily seen. The consequences were anticipated. It was all government manufactured. But the question is, is what do you do after you come upon a mess that the government and the politicians created? The best thing you can do is get out of the way because you want the prices to come down so that people will start buying them again. But politicians can't allow that to happen. Our policies in Washington still has been to try to stimulate houses and keep, keep prices up. But this whole thing about how we get involved in this uh, low interest rate to stimulate the economy, almost everybody in Washington now and almost all spectrums of the economic sphere do not believe in wage and price controls, but they believe in controlling interest rates. That's one half of the whole economy, and here we have a bunch of guys getting in a room in secret deciding what interest rates should be, and they create this mess. So yes, we need to get out of the way, but instead, the debt has to be liquidated. The mortgage derivatives was a monster. A lot of people made a lot of money on that, mm -hmm. but guess what? Federal Reserve, to the tune of trillions and trillions of dollars, as well as TARP funds, were used to bail out the people that made all this money. Guess what happened to the bad debt that should have been wiped off the book, they should have gone bankrupt? It was dumped on the taxpayers. And the taxpayers still have it. And as long as you maintain that debt on the books, you're not going to have growth. This is why Japan hasn't recovered. We're in four years now, and it's going to continue until we understand who creates the business cycle, how it happens, and what you have to do to get out of it. I would suggest the policy of the United States should be aggressively to overthrow the regime and to do everything we can to support those Cubans who want freedom. You know, Obama is very infatuated with an Arab Spring. He doesn't seem to be able to look 90 miles south of the United States to have a Cuban Spring. So I would try to put in, I would try to put in place a very aggressive policy of reaching out to every single Cuban who would like to be free, helping network them together, reaching out to the younger generation inside the dictatorship and indicating they don't have a future as a dictatorship because a Gingrich presidency will not tolerate four more years of this dictatorship. Oh, Congressman. I, I have a little bit of work to do yet on him on foreign <laughs> policy. <laughs> no. I would do pretty much the opposite. I don't like the isolationism of not talking to people. Uh, I was drafted in 1962 at the height of the Cold War when the missiles were in Cuba. And the Cold War is over. And I think we propped up Castro for 40-some years because we put on these sanctions. And this only used us as the scapegoat. He could always say, anything wrong, it's the United States' fault. But I think it's time, time to quit this isolation business of not talking to people. We talked to the Soviets. We talked to the Chinese. And we opened up trade. And we're not killing each other now. We fought with the Vietnamese for a long time. We finally gave up, started talking to them. Now we trade with them. I don't know why, why the Cuban people should be so intimidated. I, Brad, I don't know where you get this assumption that all of a sudden all the Cubans are coming here. I would thought they were going to celebrate and they're going to have a lot more freedom if we would only open up our doors and say, we want to talk to you and trade with you and come visit. We, sometimes you, they can't even send packages down there. I, I think we're living in the dark ages when we can't even talk to the Cuban people. I think it's not 1962 anymore, and we don't have to use force and intimidation and overthrow of a, in governments. I, I just don't think that's going to work. Senator Santorum, an, uh, an admittedly uh, cynical question. So we ought to have an aircraft carrier in the Gulf? an aircraft carrier, and of course the task force with it in the Mediterranean. We want to show Iran any action of that nature will be considered an act of war, an act of terror, uh, and, the, and America is going to keep those sea lanes open. So, Congressman. No, what I wanted to get involved in the discussion. <laughs> no, go ahead. Um, because the question was, uh, you know, would you go to war? And Mitt said he, he, would, he would go to war. But you have to think about uh, the preliminary act that uh, might cause them to want to close the Straits of Hormuz, and that's a blockade. We're blockading them. Can you imagine what we would do if somebody blockaded the Gulf of Mexico? That would be an act of war. So the act of war has already been committed, and this is a retaliation. But besides, there's no interest whatsoever for Iran to close the Straits of Hormuz. I mean, they need it as much as we do. I mean, so you have to put that in a perspective. But this whole idea that, uh, uh, that it's, we, we have to go to war because we've already committed an act by blockading the country, and uh, I, I don't see, I, I, and, and I think Newt is right. 
I think he's wrong about uh, World War II. I think the people were ready because we did it properly and we declared it and we won it quickly. But no, the people are not ready. We don't have any money. We have too many wars. We, the people want to come home, and they certainly don't want a hot war in Iran right now. And I, I think that would be the most foolish thing in the world to do right and now right. is take on Iran. All of you favor making English the official language of the United States, which could mean that ballots and other government documents would not be available in Spanish. But Speaker Gingrich, you're sending out press releases in Spanish. Governor Romney, you're advertising in Spanish. Why is it okay for you to court voters in Spanish, but not okay for the government to serve them in Spanish? Congressman that. Paul. Yeah, my answer is similar, but some, a little bit different, because at the national level, obviously, we have to have one language. I mean, we can't have multiple languages. So for legal reasons, we would have one language. But our system really gives us a way to be more generous, because uh, if Florida wanted to have some ballots in Spanish, I certainly wouldn't support a federal law that would prohibit Florida from a accommodating, you know, a city election or a local election or a state election, I think that's the magnificence of our system where you can solve some of these problems without dictating a, a one answer for all states. But I, nationally, we should have one language. Florida's Everglades provide one in three Floridians with their drinking water. It affects thousands of jobs. Right now, there's a, there's a joint federal state program to save what's left of the Everglades. Would you commit to continuing that federal financing of, of the Everglades Preservation? Sure. I don't, I don't see any reason to go after that. I would still look into the details on whether that could be a state issue or not. But uh, with all the wars going on and the economy is in shambles as it is and the unemployment, to, to worry about dealing with that program, we could do it in a theoretical sense, but I would see no reason to, uh, you know, complicate things, but uh, I, I wouldn't have any desire to interfere with that. At this point, we'll take another break. We'll return from Tampa with this line of questioning. Right after this. Congressman Paul, you're a doctor. What was your view of the Terry Schiavo case? Mm -hmm. I found it so unfortunate. It's so unusual, too. That, that situation doesn't come up very often. It should teach us all a lesson to have living wills or a good uh, a conversation with a spouse. I would want my spouse to make the decision. And, uh, but it's better to have a living will. But I, I don't like going up the ladder. You know, we go to the federal courts and the Congress and on up. Yes, difficult decisions. Will it be perfect for everybody? Not, but I would have preferred to see the decision made, made at the state level. But I've been involved in medicine with things similar, but not quite as difficult as this. But usually we deferred to the family and it, it wasn't made uh, a, a big issue like this was. This was way out of proportion to what happens more routinely. But I think it should urge us all to try to plan for this and uh, make sure either that one individual that's closest to you makes a decision or you sign a living will, and this would have solved the whole problem. We have gentlemen here on the three issues that got the Tea Party started that are the base of the conservative movement now in the Republican Party. And there is no difference between President Obama and these two gentlemen. And that's why this election here in Florida is so critical, that we have someone that actually can create a contrast between the president and the conservative point of view. Congressman Paul, are these two men in the middle uh, insufficiently conservative for you? Well, I, I think that the problem is, is nobody has defined what being conservative means. Go ahead. And I think that is our problem. Conservative means we have smaller government and more liberty. And yet, uh, if you ask what have we done, I think we've lost our way completely. Our rhetoric is still pretty good. But when we get in charge, we expand the government. You talk about uh, Dodd-Frank, but we gave him Sarbanes-Oxley. We gave debts as well, you know, when we're in charge. So if it means limited government, you have to ask a basic question. What should the role of government be? The founders asked that question, had a revolution, wrote a constitution. And they said the role of government ought to be to protect liberty. It's not to run a welfare state and not to be the policeman of the world. And, and so if you're going to be conservative, how can you be conservative and cut food stamps, but you won't cut spending overseas? There's not a nickel or penny that anybody will cut on the conservative side overseas spending. And we don't have the money. They're willing to start more wars. So I say if you're conservative, you want small government across the board, especially in personal liberty. What's wrong with having people, the government, out of our personal lives? So this is what we have to decide what conservative means, what limited government means. 
And I have a simple suggestion. We have a pretty good guide, and if we follow the Constitution, government would be very small, and we would all be devoted conservatives. Governor Romney again tonight. Uh, so-called Romney Care and so-called Obamacare have been positioned very closely side by side.